Welcome back, everybody. So today we've got an honestly fascinating story. This is a major thing going on in the games industry, and it will impact you and me. But it's not just today's story. I've received numerous leaks, and uh, I do have, you know, one or two contacts who are just in AAA, and, you know, we catch up. They talk about the way the wind is blowing. And we're going to talk about the future of QA in the games industry. QA is, of course, extremely important, and believe me, we know that more than at most now that our very first game has came out. And even though we QA'd it with two forms of external testing and in-house for ages, a survivorship bias-like methodology oversight meant that two vital things were not uh, were not caught. Now both of them are fixed, and yes, you can pick up um, our debut game, The Pale Beyond, over on Steam. Yeah, it is a narrative survival role-playing game, sort of inspired by the heroic age of Antarctic uh, exploration. It's absolutely going down a treat, which has been awesome to see. So yeah, check it out on Steam. We'd really appreciate that. I will loop you in on our QA journey later on in today's video, but first we've got to talk about the breaking news, and that is that Electronic Arts have uh, laid off a 200-person in QA studio, right? Uh, fired via Zoom. So imagine, right? You you wake up bright and early and you see, oh, look at this. A random meeting at 8 a.m. and it's mandatory. Hmm. So you go there, you can see here, please join uh, Magnet at 8 a.m. CST for a mandatory meeting regarding some important updates we have to share with you. Okay, doesn't seem like the most terrifying thing, but then you attend and you immediately find out that you, alongside 206 co-workers and managers, are um, terminated. Yeah, and that is because EA is pulling out, um, basically, Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana. There's a team working uh, mostly with uh, EA on Apex Legends for QA, and it's a pretty large proportion of QA. And uh, now the whole studio is functionally gone. That's it. So what's actually going on? Well, this was first reported by Kotaku, then the gamer were able to corroborate it, and uh, they were quickly told that their contracts were being ended ahead of renewal, that they can go get any personal belongings from the office if they're accompanied by security, and they're getting 60 days of severance pay, even if their contracts were actually for longer. And there's a funny thing that does crop into my head with this. Um, I was watching a video from... Um, Racevic, I'm never actually sure how to pronounce this channel name, um, but it was about uh, racing games, right? And specifically, a bunch of the QA and jank that is in the Formula One series, where people love the EA Sports F1 games, but they're just full of jank and bugs and stuff. And then you see stories like this, and you kind of think, oh man, this, is, uh, this isn't great. So, a local news service called KSLA12 spoke to some of the impacted people, right? Oh, 100% we were blindsided, and it's not just me and my co-workers of the same level. We've spoken to our managers that are considered full-time electronic arts employees and not just contractors of Magnet, and they said they had no idea uh, that any of this was happening as well. It was five minutes long, I wouldn't even call it a speech, and that's it. The man just said if people were joining, he'd repeat himself, uh, so basically, right, as people filtered into the call, he was just repeating the same, like, oh, yeah, by the way, all your contracts are gone. Uh, go, like, to the office, grab security, and they will escort you to your desk. They were told not to record. They could not send chats into the Zoom or anything like that. And that's the thing. Not even the managers were aware. Now, I know why this is going on. And I cannot wait to just share a few of the kind of leak-like things with you because it's goddamn fascinating. Uh, but yeah, none of the uh, managers were informed that their whole staff was getting cut. Um, I suppose, hey, if the managers are getting cut too, then they don't need to know. Uh, now, this group was working on Apex Legends since the very beginning. Obviously, then, this is, this is rough. Um, the person who trained me was one of the first to work on it, and they were proud of maintaining quality and secrecy for Apex, a surprise launch in 2019. That's the thing. If people knew like two months before Apex that, oh yeah, Electronic Arts just has this thing coming down the pipeline, here's some screenshots. It actually turned out then, uh, per what this person said anyway, that the QA studio was a less leaky ship than Respawn Entertainment itself. So ultimately then, it's a pretty sad statement, but we've got to ask the question of why. And we do have EA uh, who have said something, right? They've said the testing games is an integral part of developing the best experience for our players, obviously true. 
Um, they're expanding the distribution of our Apex Legends testing team and ending testing execution that's been concentrated in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, impacting services provided by our third-party provider, saying that basically global team inclusive of US people will let them increase the number of hours per week that they're able to test and optimize the game. It reflects their ongoing commitment, blah, 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 blah right so that's basically what's went on now this um actually is as they put it one of uh, themselves i mean look at this right headquartered in the top floor of uh, the state university digital media center this team makes ea's amazing uh, games even better the capital of one of ea's largest development organizations qa so really pretty damn big um right like the way that they were kind of promoting themselves but if you're wondering how that actually works then well it's a qa house right um it's still subject to the same conditions that are standard elsewhere in the industry with the uh, big old lack of respect contracts that are a bit rumbly uh, nobody working as a contractor had a contract they're uh, contractors because ea had a contract with pro unlimited who hired qa staff in a con <laughs> in a contractless positions in a right to work state. Three month contract length, extendable to a year, three contract max. That is the standard uh, for QA. They were getting paid just shy of 18 bucks an hour. That's pretty good pay for QA. Um, I work as embed QA now and only get 14 bucks an hour. Uh, maybe EA don't like how much uh, they were making. I don't know. Um, of course, this is, uh, you know, this is Louisiana, so I imagine it's not going to have the cost of living that, say, California would have, which obviously does come up whenever we talk about Californian uh, studios. And when you look at some of the wage data, they are essentially in and around like a, a living wage um, for, for the area per the MIT calculator. But overall, with a situation like this, it is about spread and it is about costs for EA. They're not removing their quality assurance from the USA entirely, but they are trying to more globally deploy their resources, right? Um, outsourcing, of course, to all these different uh, service providers in different regions can have a number of benefits, right? It's easier to have 24-7 uptime because of different time zones. A good example, whenever our game was coming out on launch weekend, we're in Ireland. Our publisher is in Australia big time zone differences, but it did mean that whenever, like, my team were signing off for, um, you know, pulling our shifts of just launch day stuff, our publisher would be able to clock in because for them, it's just normal time in Australia, right? So that's one benefit that could be seen here. So it's not necessarily a reduction in overall QA. Uh, there's still going to be people doing that, but they're probably going to, number one, spread it out geographically for those kind of like time zone benefits. And of course, obviously, cost, All right? That's the big thing, cost. I mean, even if you go within Europe, 10 euro takes you a hell of a lot further in loads of countries than it will in, say, France or maybe Ireland, right? So, that's basically that situation. Um, here's actually something a bit rough. EA just fired all the people in the office I used to work at before they fired us at 8 this morning in Baton Rouge. Just realized an hour later that they used us to train a United Kingdom team and European team that replaced us. Uh, EA, feel like explaining. I mean, as for the UK, I mean, what, your minimum uh, living wage... I think it's like £9.50 an hour. Um, obviously, what that will translate to into the US dollar does kind of depend, um, though there are like stricter employment laws here than there are in many states in America. So kind of tricky to know. But outside of the UK, uh, Romania is one of the countries that they are being outsourced to. They've been slowly hiring playtest teams across multiple time zones. No idea about them. The QA team in the UK was trained by EABR and are expected to take, uh, to take over, but they're small and have little experience with the title. So you do have this continuing, essentially, uh, this industry vibe of this is about bodies at the problem, right? This is about getting people in, I guess, young, fresh, able to take on a fairly low uh, amount of reward, trying to set targets for the number of bugs you report per unit time. This is, you know, the sort of, you know, KPI based thing that they'll do in a lot of these companies. Um, and, and that's essentially what they're doing, right? It's about more bodies at the problem. Now, what I would say is while yes, there is going to be a correlation between man hours and output. In many cases with QA, it is a highly disciplined uh, field where you really do have to be rigorous. I mean, as an example for the Pale Beyond, one of the bugs um, a few of our users were reporting, 
it took us so much time to reproduce that bug internally. Now, it basically was because some data was not being cleared out properly and the issue would only present itself in very specific scenarios after a extended duration of time. Now, that's the kind of bug that's going to be very easy for, uh, you know, you to see in a Steam forum because... I don't know, 10,000 people have played through your game. But that's the sort of bug that when you just have a few QA people, in our case, like one internally, a bunch externally, it's actually quite hard to find a bug like that. And as a group, we have learned so much about QA that now we'll be way better at QAing our future titles. But it does show, I think, that QA is a discipline that you'll get a lot better at over time and I really would say that a very experienced, top-notch QA tester, they are going to be able to solve problems so much faster and have so much of a better intuition, especially if they are spending a lot of time on the same game or with the same fundamental technologies because they can sort of get used to, well, what are the sorts of problems that crop up with this game, with this engine, with this tech stack, with this development team? This is where more bodies the problem is an issue. So while Electronic Arts here may actually end up with a more cost competitive solution for their quality assurance, and they also may have more 24 seven uptime, which could be pretty useful. I mean, imagine your developers, wherever Respawn's offices are, your developers clock out for the day, right? They go home, they have a sleep, maybe in Europe or somewhere else. QA testers are doing QA. And then you have a situation where the developers, you know, they, they, they come in and they see all the reports that have been generated and not bottlenecking each other as much. So you can absolutely see those sorts of benefits. But this nearly 200 person team was specifically good at QA testing Apex Legends because they'd been doing it since before Apex Legends came out. So even though organizationally, structurally, you can see a lot of benefits to what EA may be doing here, the issue then is you lose that experience. And that experience really is the vital thing. But I mean, even that we just have this situation where we can actually say that here, uh, at least in the US, and I would imagine the same in those sort of big outsourcing houses like the one in Romania, maybe the one in the, uh, the UK that's been talked about here, where you just have a three-month contract. Let's say you're 22 years old. Maybe a three-month rolling contract is okay because, hey, you could be working in retail, but if you can instead be in QA, that's maybe better for the career path that you want. But you'll rapidly get to a stage where this is just not what somebody really wants to build their career off. So it, it does cause a big problem. I mean, with our QA, that's full-time salaried with benefits and all that jazz, right? And that's good because we know and I'll talk later about how it's been very impressed upon us, the extreme importance of it. We know that this is something that long-term we have to be amazing at and that for any things we do in the future, we'll have internal QA from the very beginning. Like that is so important. And it's skilled QA, right? Skilled QA is really good at using all the tools, doing stuff in the engine, like an amazing resource, an amazing thing for our team to have. So for me, the idea that I would just, uh, as somebody running a studio, say, ah, okay, right, uh, it's about, you know, it's a few months away from launch. Let's get uh, eight people in a three-month contract to QA test the game. Now, would there be utility in that? Yes, there would. But would you actually be building up a long-term asset for your business? No, uh, you would not. I would also say there'll be a degree of selection bias here. If this is the sort of terms that you're offering, well you're not going to get uh, the candidates with more experience because they're going to understand that they deserve better. Now, ultimately, we're in a situation, and this is where I'm going to talk about leaks. Um, quite a few people have uh, have leaked to me, especially after doing a rather fiery topic on, the, uh, on our World of Warcraft channel, right? Um, and I'm not going to talk about any privileged data or anything like that. I just want to communicate to you the overall vibe. And uh, this is something I can corroborate with talking to some AAA uh, dev friends, which is across like, you know, engineering and a few other things. Broadly speaking, the games industry is moving towards outsourced QA uh, and away from in-house QA. And this is especially the case in places where game development is concentrated in an expensive region, like, say, Irvine, California, which is where Blizzard Entertainment is. So even for the Blizzard thing, it's very much been a uh, policy in recent enough years. And this is something people had went through in the past, but it very much is the policy that uh, they do not want to be 
big time increase in QA in Irvine. Uh, because ultimately, you think about the way that they value QA. If they're going to have internal QA, then those people, you know, I, I would call QA developers, but it's obvious that Blizzard wouldn't, um, unfortunately, at least from, you know, they might to get brownie points, but in terms of how they treat them, they don't. They're probably going to have smaller teams of senior, very experienced QA, uh, or at least this is what would be ideal, I would say. You would have that internally, and then you would outsource and then you would have both the benefits of scale and the benefits of speciality. I think the issue, though, is Blizzard uh, sort of serially underinvesting in QA, um, not treating their QA people right, and then Mike Yabara making his fatal flaw in saying that QA and customer service are not a long-term discipline. Uh, this is something that the company has been sort of pushing as a point of policy. Uh, over the last few years, of sort of numerous people have told me that. And it's hardly a surprise when you then say, look at World of Warcraft Dragonflight which was buggy. And uh, I mean, I've certainly heard things that would suggest that, yeah, it's buggy for a reason. And uh, those familiar with the matter aren't surprised. And I know it's sometimes annoying if I just sit here and talk in these sort of vague terms, like, you know, trust me, bro. But you know how it is. Uh, for me, like with our tips email address, which is tips at valuether.games, for me, it is less about me wanting to go in and, you know, extract headlines from sources or something like that. Honestly, I just want to have more of an understanding of the human perspectives of people who work in the games industry so that when I talk about these overall trends, I can do so in a way that feels authentic to the experience of people who ultimately are working at a scale that I'm not working at and who are working in a region that I'm not working at, that I'm not used to working at, right? So that's overall the vibe that I have got um, from the more AAA people it has essentially been similar, but from the perspective of, listen, the salaries in Irvine and just those places in, in California and other major game hubs, they are so insane that they basically price QA at the level that these companies are willing to pay for QA out of the region. Again, I would say because there's a serial undervaluing of QA um, in such a way that uh, you should be able to get, I mean, I don't know if they were talking about $22 an hour, $23 an hour for some of that Blizzard QA, you should be able to get 30 bucks an hour of value out of QA, maybe 35 bucks an hour, maybe 40 bucks an hour, because ultimately, like even there's a few people on Twitter who are in the WoW Classic QA team, and apparently that's a pretty small, pretty specialized QA team, one that I would imagine is very low on its morale right now, based on what its people were saying. So that's a relatively small number of people doing QA for WoW Classic, which is a fairly major product. And this same thing obviously does move over to customer service. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we've all had a negative outsourced customer experience for customer service. I certainly have. Um, now it's been fine. Anytime it's with Blizzard, you know, I go on the phone. It's basically someone from down the road in Cork. I mean, quite a bit down the road, but you know, that's all well and good and it's internal in Blizzard. But then we've all had those times where it's clearly just farmed out to some other random country where those people are not employees of the company you're trying to interface with. And ultimately, those uh, customer service staff, they are stuck in a position where they can't help you. All they can do is follow a script and a process because they're not really, say, a staff member of Virgin Media. And it's a situation where you're just throwing humans into the meat grinder in a way that pisses off your customers and burns through your customer service staff. And for a company like, say, Blizzard, I think this is quite common in the games industry. Uh, someone I know, uh, Chunky Ninja, who's uh, a, um, he does video editing and graphics for Preach, uh, for Mike, you know, Preach Gaming. Um, he was just talking about his Ubisoft customer service experience and just how like, yeah, the ticker got randomly closed and that was that. I didn't get help or even within World of Warcraft. You know, Blizzard customer service used to be awesome. It is not as good as it was. I've certainly heard about what happened. Uh, obviously, Blizzard's European customer service with the closure of its Versailles office is pretty much next. Um, I think things are pretty rough in the Cork office. And um, I at least heard from an ex-employee, this is speaking 10 years ago, of whenever they first had the winds of change, right? Where, you know, suddenly the Americans came over to the Cork office, things started getting a lot more KPI focused, but they ultimately felt that they're, and this is even though apparently like Europe was actually performing better than America uh, for CS, um, but ultimately it was like bad for the long-term health of the institution. 
And then is it any wonder in so many of the games that we play, we have a customer service experience that is profoundly unhelpful and automated. If you're going to be automated, then you have to have Amazon money and just have Amazon's customer service perspective of, ah, fuck it, we're Amazon, refund it, it's not a problem. We have infinite money anyway. So ultimately then, guys, that is the situation with this story. Um, obviously, a lot of good is being said about EA in general. They actually have a fairly good rap for uh, work conditions compared to other AAAs. This is a what you could call a strategic realignment of their staffing. Um, there's an obvious human cost, though. And I think we've been able to talk through some of the major trends in the games industry, which ultimately impact us because it sucks and buggy games come out. And of course, we have a bit of a perspective on that because we actually did release a fairly buggy game. Yeah. And this is obviously a situation where I'll, I'll always be frank and straight up with you um, with that, like for the pale beyond. Uh, you know, the amount of copies that it sold above expectations, user reviews, very high. Even with the problems that we suffered from, we're at like 89% in Steam. And for your debut game to be 89% is just absolutely awesome. Um, you can probably tell that our reviews are nearly 500 now. Uh, for an indie game to achieve that within like six or seven days is really good. We're probably in the top 10th percentile of indie games on Steam by revenue in our like first week. And you may think that means, oh, wow, uh, where's the Lambos? No, absolutely not. Uh, that number is less a reflection of indie game money being great and more a reflection of indie game money being really, 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 really bad because it turns out grossing 100 grand is enough to like put you almost in the top uh, 10th percentile, um, which obviously you know, the budget for the Pale Beyond was a lot more than uh, 100 grand and we've got to pay back our recoup and we've got to pay back many other things. So it's absolutely you know, not a situation of where's the money. Um, but overall then, our experience with QA was we did the best that we could. Like we really did. We were in-house QA. We had a really good bug board. We were trying to blast through those tasks. Ultimately, what got us though, um, if you've been playing The Pale Beyond, it's the issue with basically UI uh, resource cards on the manifest having generally inconsistent behavior. That happened because of a last, not it wasn't a last minute optimization, but it was an optimization, uh, optimization after we shipped Goldmaster. Um, I won't really talk about the reasons why the optimization was made because we could have reverted it and it would have been fine on the PC platform. Um, but ultimately it was one of those things. It was QA'd, signed off, ticked on, all was good, all was working, optimization happened. The way in which it broke was rather counterintuitive, seemingly because of a bunch of race conditions that, uh, oh, yeah, basically it is what it is. But that's a great example of we had the resources to not have this problem. But ultimately, our development methodology towards the end, because of some external reasons that led to Thomas being rather overtasked, which, yeah, uh, were unfortunate, um, but uh, that basically led to that slipping in. The other one then was, and I cannot believe this because if, if like you're also, uh, you know, from a programming background or something, you'll, you'll be like, oh my God, really? It was an object pooling problem? Yeah, yeah, it was an object pooling problem. And that is why for some reason, if you tried to put canned food in the hoosh pot after you played for a few hours, it would also look like it was expanding your dogs. Don't worry, it was never intended that you'd be putting dogs into the hoosh pot. Anyway, the good news is uh, we have since fixed these things. And what's been really great is over in that room, we've got Adam and QA, we've got Thomas on development, right? So uh, Adam and James, they are both crawling the Steam forums, doing everything they can to actually get the bugs in. Thomas will come up with a solution and he'll implement that solution. Then it immediately goes into QA testing. Because we have dedicated QA, um, Adam can then test because one of the things he'll be doing is isolating how to replicate a bug, right? So he'll have that replicated, he will then ensure that the bug can no longer be replicated after the fix. And then he will test everything he can think of to break it with Thomas's development guidance of trying to be like, hmm, well, how could this break? And it's meant that the two of them um, have just been this like absolute hit squad of, uh, of bug crushers. And now we're at the stage where the two major bugs that screwed us over hardcore on launch have been quashed which is certainly good news. So uh, yeah, if you would like to pick up The Pale Beyond, 
those major issues are now gone, and thankfully the game is far more standing upon the strengths that really shone through in its reviews. Like, um, you know, how the game design is informing the story, the characters, all of those things that make it a very nice immersive experience. But that being said, one of the nice things about us now having this process very well refined and running quite well internally, um, and the game also doing pretty well, is we're now thinking like, okay, there are certain aspects of our design that now that we've seen thousands of people play, we definitely think could be better. So we're basically going to try to Sean Murray the shit out of this. Um, you know, we've got a game that's hitting an 89 in Steam. Um, for me, that just means like, okay, this is a diamond that needs polishing. It needs, you know, it does need to be in better state. But the fact that it's got an 89 uh, just means like, holy shit, you know, we've, uh, we have a little bit of lightning in the bottle. So instead of just going and doing another thing, Let's see, is there any cut content? You know, is there a, you know, cut content just naturally from the dev process that we can try to restore? Is there more that we can do? Um, so that's basically our plan right now. And uh, I suppose a little bit of context to you, because I thought it would be quite rich if we've just recently had a game launch that was unfortunately saddled with some bugs. And then I talked about QA in a video. Uh, you know, it really would be leaving out the elephant in the room. So that's basically that situation. Um, obviously, I hope the impacted staff here end up being okay. And uh, hopefully, we all leave this with more of an understanding of the importance of the QA process and a little bit of CS2. Of course, if you'd like to support what we're doing, the best way to do that is to pick up the Pale Beyond over on Steam. The link, of course, will be down below. And uh, I'll tell you that even through all of you know those uh, bits of texture, let's just say, I am so goddamn proud of what the team have done. Um, I basically, I fucking love it to pieces. Um... Yeah, it's, it feels very meaningful uh, for, it just feels meaningful to be attached to the project. And uh, I absolutely cannot wait for what the future holds. So have a great day, everybody, and I'll see you next time.